Mark Devine, welcome to the podcast, man. Uh, stoked to have you here. It's uh, we were just talking about how you're at one of Tony's big events, and now we're here. Um, so I'm really excited to have you here, man. Thanks, Stu. Yeah, me too. Super stoked. Uh, absolutely. And so I would love it if you could start off by giving our audience just kind of an idea of what did life look like for little Mark as you were growing up in upstate New York. <laughs> The education of little Mark. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so I was born at a very young age in a small town. How much time do we have? <laughs> yeah, right. We got a good amount of time. Okay. Yeah, I was actually was in a very small town, um, 370 some odd people. I kid you not. What was the town? That was called Barneville, New York. Now, actually, we moved there when I was, let's say, seven years old. So before that, I was actually multinational. I lived in Russia Corners, Poland, New York. <laughs> which huh. was even smaller. It was, it was not a town. It was like a, just a little hamlet, you know, a little a neighborhood. bend in the road with a few houses in it that happened to have this multinational name to it. I, who knows, right, why <laughs> yeah. that came about. But anyways, you know, upstate New York, especially in the, the 60s, 70s, 80s, um, let's just say all the way to today, is yeah. extremely rural. Um, it was dairy farming, uh, beautiful rolling, you know, hillsides, lots of places to roam and to play. And then a little bit further north from us is the uh, is a national treasure. It's called the Adirondack Park. I don't know if you've ever been there. Six million acres of protected um, land, and um, you know, very very strict developmental guidelines. You know, for the private ownership and the small towns that are up there. And the town of Lake Placid, which hosted the Olympics, the Winter Olympics twice, is up there. And that's where we had a summer home. And so, what was really unique about my life at is I had two homes. One was kind of the school year home that was down in that small town of Barneveld, which was a bumper yeah. community to a larger city called Utica, which is uh, a declining industrial city. It's starting to make a comeback in services and whatnot. But, and my, my family was um, the inheritors of a of industrial business that had been around and started in the um, late 1700s by a divine, Dang. two of them. And so the business is called Divine Brothers. <laughs> pretty nice. creative yeah <laughs> and so that was kind of been handed down to you know then handed down and then my father uh, inherited it yeah. when he was 30 when uh his father had a stroke and so suddenly he was a 30 year old running this business and so it, that that energy of the divine family business and my dad's involvement in it and it was you know heavy industry back in, when um liability was um and litigation around liability for accidents was massive. This is before OSHA standards and whatnot. And God, there was a lot of stress in the house around finances and union battles and lawsuits. <laughs> At the same time, it was pretty much expected, as uh, a lot of people kind of appreciate who are listening, that you know what the family did is what you're going to do, right? Or what the family right. thinks is. Uh, reasonable or, or an acceptable career path is kind of what you're going to do, right? So that's that's an age-old story. So I was kind of groomed uh, subconsciously and even overtly to kind of come back into the family business or to be in, the, you know, go out and get some work experience, but chances are you'll end back at the family business. And guess what? My three siblings are all working at the family business and huh. running it to this day. <laughs> and I was heading down that path, Stu. You know, I tell that story in my book, The Way of the Sea. I was heading down that path. You know, I I can circle back and tell you, you know, uh, what changed for me and why I think the Adirondack Mountains had a big part in that. But, you know, on the outside, I was basically doing the right things. I was checking the right boxes. You know, I did great in high school, but it was a podunk, you know, um, public high school. I didn't really have to work hard and I didn't really learn how to study. It wasn't like one of these city schools where we had AP classes and all that stuff. In fact, maybe right. that's the future where they're getting rid of all this stuff. That's a whole different discussion, right? Yeah. <laughs> About our culture, so, what's going on. So, so I was I, checking the right boxes. I was going to do the right thing. Right. I was the golden child, you know? And anyways, so I yeah. could keep going down the path. You sound and, like you got a question. <laughs> yeah. And so, cause I know eventually you went, you went on to college, you eventually got, became a CPA, you got your master's. Yeah, that's right. I'm curious, do you think that was, or I guess I would ask you, why did you choose to take that path? Well, that's what I'm alluding to. It, it wasn't really right, like there was a whole lot of other options that were popping into my mind at the time. You know, I, um, I went to Colgate university. I'm really grateful for that school. The opportunity was great. It's a great school. Mm -hmm. I was an average student there. I went from straight A's in, in the public high school to like 
straight B minuses. It, it was a very, very academically challenging institution. And um, I, I lacked a lot of confidence. You might think that would be, you know, interesting for me to say that, you know, because yeah. here I am a really successful entrepreneur and former Navy SEAL and author and blah, blah, right. blah, blah, whatever you want to say about me. <laughs> yeah. But I lacked a lot of confidence. Now, there was something else that I didn't mention. Not only did I come from this very small town, so I had very insular, limited experience, but um, there was a lot of chaos in my family, you know, and so I know... Um, Again, I'm not alone in that, right? Where there was alcohol right. and there was rage, and you know, my body, my my body, you know, underwent some lashings repeatedly, you know, with the belt, week in and week out, you know, for many many yeah. years. So my dad would um, he would favor the belt over dialogue, right, to get his mm -hmm. message across. And really, he was just expressing his own rage and he was his own inability to to cope with what's going on in himself internally. And so, and then there was a lot of clash between my mom and dad. And so it was just that, you know, classic, uh, you know, kind of tumultuous, traumatic childhood that then I grew yeah. up. And so the, the reaction to that from me was to really shut down and to um, kind of build a little wall inside of me and to become emotionally, you know, un un inaccessible, which wreaked havoc on my relationships yeah. with women. You know, so I burned through girlfriends because I would sit there, <laughs> you know, like someone had sewed right. my lips shut, you know? <laughs> Like, don't you have anything to say? I'm like, well, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At any rate, it, and it's not like I didn't have a lot of girls interested. Let's put it that way. So, right. anyways, so that's let, a whole separate story. But I was, I was kind of tortured, Stu, in that regard. Like, there was all this confusion going on inside of me, and so I was just like doing the best I could to march a path that seemed to be the right path that society had laid out for me, that my families had laid right. out for me, that seemed to be like, okay, Mark's going to be doing well if he gets his bachelor's degree, if he gets a good job. And guess what? I got a great job with Cooper's and Library and now Pricewaterhouse Coopers, and they sponsored me to go to NYU Business School, top 10 business school. So, oh, guess yeah. what? And a few more notches on the belt totally. to say Mark is a good guy and he's a smart guy and he's you know, socially acceptable and he's going he's gonna to succeed with air quotes. So that's the path I took and I didn't quit. You know, I got my MBA and my CPA and I worked for my ass off for four years as an auditor, you know, and if you, if you told me right now, Hey, if you gave me a challenge to you <laughs> said, Hey, Mark, you can go back and be an auditor or go back through Navy SEAL training and get your ass kicked by the hardest military training in the world, which would you do? I said, hundred percent. I'll go back to SEAL training tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I, so, so one thing I, that you kind of mentioned that, that I think I would kind of love to hear how, how you cross this bridge is right. you said that at one point you didn't have all the confidence. And I think one right. thing that's interesting is like, no matter what you're trying to do in your life, whether you're trying to get hired for a position or figure out what you want, it's like one of the things Tony Robbins teaches, right? Is you can be in a state of, you know, focusing on, I can't do this, or I'm not confident, or I could never make it and you're not going to get the same result as if you can tap into this part of yourself that goes, I am confident. I do believe in myself, right? You're going to get completely different results being those two different people. And Absolutely. so I'm curious for you, how can someone, if they're listening to this and they don't have a ton of confidence, how would you say you kind of built that confidence in yourself and how could maybe they do the same? Well, it's, I don't believe it's something that can be, um, you can snap a finger and change something like that. <laughs> yeah. You can have an understanding of it by listening to this podcast that, wow, you know what, maybe I do have the, the raw material to be amazing. Yeah. And yet it's going to take a little time to scrape off the barnacles and to uncover that awesomeness because it's being hidden. You're hiding it from yourself. So what did that for me was, and this kind of goes back to one of the reasons I'm so grateful for the mountains is that, you know, to get away from all the chaos in my youth, I would, you know, kind of escape into the great outdoors. And, and that's one reason, probably the main reason I became an endurance athlete, because I would, as a young guy with tons of energy, you know, I wouldn't just go for a little wandering hike, although sometimes I would do that. I would go for trail runs, you know, and, and like yeah. really rigorous trail runs up mountains, bounding down, you know, playing tag with my friend, you know, just, just getting scraped and bruised and, you know, battered, but having a ball. Right. 
And um, I had moments where, you know, where we would run up these Adirondack mountains. Now it's not like running up the Rockies, right? Those are, mad. these are 4,000 feet high, but you know, it could, and a, a good hike, a good day hike could be 18 miles, you know, both getting in there and, and summoning and back down Dang. 18 to 20 some odd miles. And I would, I would run those. Right. And often when I got to the summit, you know, and the, there are peaks that when you get to the top, there's a tree line, the trees disappear. And now you're walking on yeah. granite and you get to the top and it's such an exhilarating moment to finally get to the top. And you just got this 360 degree, just stunningly beautiful panoramic view and, and your mind is burned. I mean, you're just, you're physically and mentally exhausted from the climb. <laughs> yeah. And so you just sit, you know, this experience where you just sit and you just, everything stops. Like the whole world comes to a stop. And that was my first experience, you know, with kind of spiritual states and flow and, and time kind of warping and having, you know, out of body experiences like, what, like, whoa, I mean, one of them was just so powerful where I was literally just expanding away from myself. And I was just seeing myself sitting there on this mountaintop. This is all, you know, a 17 year old, 18 year old kid. Yeah. So that was one of those things I didn't really understand. I was just like, cool. I wanted to go back to the Adirondacks more, you know, and do that. But um, it was planting a seed, right? It was my mind was being trained by those long and arduous, you know, solitary in nature kind of experiences. And then those flow states where everything stopped is also training my mind, you know, to, to be able to access, you know, now what we know as the non-physical or spiritual dimension. So anyways, fast forward, you know, I, I kind of, um, at Colgate, I took up competitive swimming. I was actually recruited to swim there. And so swimming had mm. a little bit similar, but different quality to it, where there was a lot of repetition, you know, and there was, there was breath control in swimming. So through swimming, I learned how to control my breathing and how to breathe rhythmically and deeply and to also concentrate deeply and, and tune out thinking because when you swim, it's like back and forth. It drives most people crazy because you're just going back and forth <laughs> yeah. and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. No podcast, no music, you know, it's just you and your right. thoughts, you know? So I got really good at kind of tuning out my thoughts and developing concentration through swimming. So that was cool. That was another piece of the puzzle. Now I'm, I'm getting to your specific question of what really transformed yeah. me. The third piece of the puzzle is my swim coach at Colgate University was kind of a pioneer in sports psychology. And so he was, you know, we were hmm. experimenting with visualization. And I had a profound experience, not unlike what I described on the hilltop, but it was different from, the, right. it was more like the power of visualization. So he asked me to um, practice swimming my race, which was a 200 meter breaststroke, which is eight lengths of the 50 meter pool. Um, at, uh, you know, at night with a stopwatch. And um, at first, you know, I could barely swim a few strokes before my mind would start, you know, wandering off. And then over time, I would, um, I finally, you know, after a couple months of doing this, I was able to do all eight legs. And, you know, I would have the timer. And the time that I was getting uh, was about three seconds faster than my fastest time. As you know, that's yeah. a freaking lifetime in swimming, right? Right. So long story short, you know, that was, let's see, sophomore year. And then I, um, I had applied for, and another interesting story, but I probably won't go into it here. Um, I was a long shot, but I got into an overseas study program for economics. And I got in because, you know, one of the all-star students who had applied had flaked out and just, you know, mm. gone on a binge or something and didn't respond to the <laughs> professor yeah. and I, I kept showing up to all the meetings and and even though I was a B student and everyone else is 4.0 and he's like you don't have the chance of getting this program at the end of the day I was I was the one always there right you know I was the one who always showed up and so he took me that was cool and life-changing but anyways what it meant is I didn't swim my um my junior fall I didn't even touch a pool because I was in Europe right so I came back um in the spring and uh I ran into the swim coach and he said, hey, Mark, you know, good to see you. And we had pleasantries about, you know, the experience and everything. He said, by the way, we have our, uh, our big tournament next week. You know, I still consider you part of the team if you want to jump in the water. Of course, I didn't want to. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but I said I would because, I, you know, this guy was my mentor, one of my mentors. So yeah. I remember this as clear as day. Like, there I am on the, on the block. The gun goes off. I jump in the water and I start swimming my breaststroke race. And I'm, I've had this uncanny feeling that I've swum this race before. 
Mm-hmm. And when I touch the timer at the end and I look up, I got the time that I visualized a year before in all those training mm-hmm. sessions. And it was like one of those t- moments also where I was like, wow, yeah. check that out. I, I had, I swam that race. I won that race. I got that time in my mind. And now I got it in the real world nine mm-hmm. months later, a year later. <laughs> so that memory also got planted. Anyway, so then I, I fast forward, I get done with my senior year and I fumble my way into this job hmm. and they send me to NYU. So I start NYU, I'm working full time and I'm going to school at night and, um, and I, I immediately am starting to think, how am I going to stay in shape? Like I, I didn't like what, what everyone I looked around, like there weren't athletes <laughs> like I was and you know I'm in a suit and tie at a desk all day long and then at school all day night and so <clears throat> I said I'm not gonna go into this long decline and be some kind of fat out of shape middle-aged crisis person so I'm gonna stay mm-hmm. in shape so I would get up at early and you know run six miles in Prospect Park because I was in um, I was in Brooklyn living and then when everyone would go to lunch, I would go to the gym and like bang out what I now would call a high intensity functional workout. Back then it was just like a lot of different things done fast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> and then, totally. and then after school, I had a couple hours or after your work, I had a couple hours. They let us go at five. We didn't have to be at school at NYU until seven thirty, And that was down by the world trade center. But so I was like, I got time to, to cram something else in. And I remembered that my freshman roommate, Dave Bowman, had gotten into karate at Colgate. And now, now mind you, Stu, Dave was a real asshole. Like he, <laughs> he was just a jerk to all the, you know, all the people in my dorm. And you know, I remember him yeah. bringing, you know, basically stealing these dumbbells from the gym and from the top bunk, launching them onto the floor, which not only ruined the floor, but it would just really bug the girls who lived beneath us, yeah. which is why he was doing it. Right. So I was like, Dave. Oh man, I couldn't yeah. wait to stop, you know, to stop living with him and move on. Right. And, um, and I did, and I saw him, you know, not frequently, but over the course of the next four years, I watched him transform. And by the mm-hmm. time he was a senior and we graduated, he was a black belt and he went off to Japan to teach English and to continue his studies. And he was a completely different person. He was really humble and respectful and quiet. Right. And I was like, Hmm, you know, four years of Colgate made me four years older and I had a degree. <laughs> and had a little bit of experience, you know, with this, right. especially the European travel. Four years of Colgate transformed him as a human being. There was something hmm. demonstrably different about him. And I couldn't really figure out what it was, but I remembered that too. So here I am in New York and I'm thinking, ah, I, I think I want to do what Dave did. And as soon as I <laughs> yeah. had that thought, literally a, a couple of days later, I'm walking down 23rd Street. Actually, this is before I moved to Brooklyn. I, I won for one year, I was on 22nd Street. I was walking down 23rd Street, and I heard these shouts coming from this uh, building, and I was standing underneath it on the street, and I look up, and it said World Sato Karate Headquarters. And I was like, hmm, you know, I'm yeah. starting to believe in synchronicity by this time in my life. Totally. Ask him for So I walk name. up the stairs, and, and there is this Japanese guy, about 40-something years old, maybe 5'8", but he looked like, you know, he filled the room with his presence. Right. And like, he's intense and he's, and he's shouting orders and everyone's doing this stuff and there's screams going on. And then he stops and then he says something and he just starts cracking up like a little schoolgirl, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And he was just like radiating energy. And I was like, holy shit, that's, I want that. And so I signed yeah. up on the spot and that was the grandmaster. He became my teacher. Hmm. I went to all his classes. And then of course I took some other classes that, you know, I had to take because I was a white belt. So I started training with him. Now, within a month, I, I saw on Thursday nights, these black belts would stick, would stick around. I would stay and watch the black belts train. And I saw that a right. small group of them would stay and they did a meditation class. Hmm. So I asked uh, Mr. Nakamura if I could join the meditation class because, you know, they were all black belts who were in it. And he said, sure. Now, mind you, this is 1986 or 80. Yeah, 1986. And um, meditation was really not well known. You know, there was some knowledge about Zen. And I think TM was just starting to find a little bit of a foothold, but it's really fringe back then. And um, 
And so like for the school that had literally over a thousand students in the middle of the biggest city in the world, there were about 10 that would do this class. Hmm. And so I became one of them. And so I sat down on that bench and began the process of Zen. And there was no real instruction. Like the, the only instruction he gave us was count to 10 without thinking. So, and here's how it worked. You, you start, watch your breath and you inhale and you exhale and that's one. Yeah. And then you inhale and you exhale and that's two. But if you think, you know, you go back to zero, right? You get right. penalized. It's like boot camp. You go back to zero and start over. And so people, you know, when you start, you're like, yeah, I got to 10. You're like, did you really? Yeah, no, you right. got to 10, but you were thinking the whole time, you know, it's called split attention. So I, I, I was really good at split attention. Like, yeah, this is easy. No, it's not easy because the whole time I'm breathing and counting, I'm actually, my mind thinking. is wandering, thinking or fantasizing or whatever. So it took me a while to, to really develop that concentration power where I could just, just hold my mind on that one act of just inhaling and exhaling and then counting a number. That's actually two acts, but, you know, we, we combined it as one. And gosh, just to get to like three or four was victory. <laughs> Yeah. You know, after months of training, this is why people really, it's a struggle. This is not the best path, right? This is a difficult path. There's, you know, some preparatory work that I found that can really help people start to meditate, you know, and I call it box breathing. So we want to, you know, we can talk about that. Right. Later. So, so yeah. Anyways, let me put this together a little bit. So here I right. was. I'm in New York. I'm thinking I'm going to be a CPA or, you know, build this, you know, I wanted, I, my thought was I'll get the MBA, get the CPA, I'll move into finance. I'll make a ton of money. And then maybe I'll go back to the family business. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, but every Thursday night I would come back to that bench and I would practice my meditation and I would have stuff started to happen. Right. And so one of the things that started to happen is that every once in a while, I would have that similar experience to what I had on the mountaintop hmm. where I would just like drop off into a completely different mind state where I was, yeah. I was out of my mind in, in the sense of out of my thinking mind and into something different. Didn't know what to call it or what it was. That was one thing. The second thing that happened is I began to get a lot of images and, and sensations and, you know, what we now call intuitive hits. And, um, and so I started the journaling practice, right? Again, this is well before I had any, I never taken a leadership development or personal yeah, development. Yeah. I didn't know about Tony Robbins or anything. Subsequent to this, I actually learned about Brian Tracy and Tony Robbins. I started listening to some tapes to try to like puzzle piece together some of the things that I was experiencing right. and doing on my own. And that was helpful. But um, this has all preceded that. And so the meditation just started to crack my brain open and it, it created that metacognitive split to where I started to like partition my brain to be able to, to be able to cognitively watch my thoughts and journal about my thoughts and my patterns. And then to ask, and that led to me asking different questions hmm. because what I saw was that in the path that I was taking, I was not happy. I was not, it, it just didn't feel right. It, I didn't feel happy. I felt ungrounded. I felt like there was a conflict going on. And so I had to ask questions like, what is that about? So I, you know, I, I divided the questions into three categories. What am I really passionate about? And if I, you know, and what I'm doing, is that leading me toward what I'm passionate about or away from it? Hmm. And I got the answer when I asked those questions that it was moving away from what I'm passionate about. Cause I was passionate about, um, athleticism. I was passionate about fitness. I was passionate about adventure. I was passionate about the outdoors. Right. I was passionate about, you know, <laughs> growth. I was starting not, to really not being a CPA. It wasn't a, being a CPA and it wasn't about the money and it wasn't even about business. Right? right. Some people are passionate about that stuff. And I am now to some degree, but not at the expense of that other stuff. Right. Yeah. And so those, that was very revealing to me. Like, Oh, wow. Interesting. The second question I asked is, what am I really principled about? Like what, what principles, you know, I see this guy Nakamura living by a very set of, you know, pretty clearly defined principles. And I like those principles. And so I began to adopt those kind of warrior principles, discipline, yeah. dedicated training, mind, body, spirit, you know, hard work equals results, that kind of thing. 
And then I, so then I looked at the principles of kind of the community that I was part of in that kind of finance New York business community. And I'm like, it seems like there's some misalignment here as well. Yeah. And then the last question I asked was, gosh, if that's not right for me, then what is and why? And that boiled down into, you know, the whole purpose of your podcast. And what is my purpose? Yeah. What is my purpose? And, and so I didn't have a good answer for that, but I did start when, when I asked the question and when I was meditating, I started to get a feeling and some imagery that I was a warrior. So this is my first experience with this idea of life purpose or calling. And um, when I reflected back on it, I recognized that the calling, the signals of a calling are very archetypal. And they can change in, in one's life. They can evolve as you evolve. So for me, you know, this idea that I'm meant to be a warrior and I was me I meant to fulfill that in a really unique way. Like, cause you could be a warrior in the corporate world, right? right? You could be a corporate activist, but, and, but that wasn't it for me, but because of my warrior disciplines that I was developing in the principles and because I was passionate about being outdoors and adventure and fitness and this and that, then these three things started to kind of coalesce into this like arc that was pulling me towards something. And this is the second synchronistic moment is when I started to feel that pull and I didn't know how it would play out. Right. And I didn't, I didn't jump out of my job. I didn't make drastic changes. I was like, I'm just going to meditate on this. I'm going to keep journaling. I'm going to keep meditating because something's being revealed to me here. I started to trust my intuition or my spiritual self. And I was doing a ton of reading at the time, you know, a lot of reading about Zen and I got into all sorts of, you know, whatever was available that I could get my hands on, you know, right. started reading about Jungian archetypes and um, Bradford, you know, and family systems, you know, I started to understand yeah. what was going on with my family, you know, all this stuff, right. just consuming, you know, like you do. And, and a lot of others just consuming anything you get your hands on trying to piece together what was going on. And, um, and so I started to get these images of me serving as a warrior in kind of demanding, harsh, you know, kind of like gritty ways. And I was thinking like that could have been, you know, past life kind of sensations or, you know, my spirit. I think, you know, I've been a warrior yeah. for many lifetimes now that I know more about this. So the, the second synchronistic event was one day I was walking either home or to school. I can't remember exactly. And I passed a Navy recruiting office. I didn't know it was a Navy recruiting office, but I just stopped because on the wall in the window was a poster and the title of the poster was be someone special. And it had pictures of really cool shit happening. Like guys jumping out of the <laughs> yeah. plane and free fall, you yeah. know, and diving and underwater in these mini submarines and, and a sniper that you could barely see in a sniper hide site. I'm like, that's it. And it didn't say anything about the SEALs. It just was that, be someone special, U.S. Right. Navy. So I went into the recruiting office the next day and I said, you know, that poster up front, who are those guys? And they're huh. like, oh, they're, they're the Navy SEALs. You don't want to do that. <laughs> I'm like, nah. I do want to do that. <laughs> yes, yeah. I do. They're like, dude, those guys are badass. They're killers. You know, they tried to talk me out of it. I said, no, 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 right. I want, I want to do that. So let's, let's go down this path and figure it out. You know, yeah. that's a whole nother story. So anyway, so that's I it. Now, it was meditation bench and all the, the confluence of, of the intuition and the, and the mental development and the spiritual development and trust and journaling yeah. and asking those questions. What am I passionate about? What is my purpose? And what is my, what are my principles? And then having those coalesce into like a moment of clarity. And then the spirit world did the rest for me or my guides, you know, whatever you insert, you know, how you think that happens, synchronicity, right. the non-physical showing me the reality because I was open to it. And so that was my path, my calling. And so what an incredible gift to find that at 26 years old, 24. And then I, I, I trusted it and I, the process of getting in, you know, they told me, Mark, you got 
like you'd have a better chance of becoming an astronaut than a Navy SEAL from the civilian world because all the officers, I wanted to be an officer, all the officers come from the U.S. Naval Academy or the ROTC mm -hmm. programs. They only take one or two possibly a year out of the civilian, you know, and you go right. through officer candidate school. And I said, well, I'm going to be one of those too because it, it just feels right. And that's and where the visualization of, came in. You know, I started to visualize it every day. Right. And you think of, I mean, a traditional CPA, you don't, most people don't envision, oh yeah, my CPA is going to come become a Navy SEAL. And so one of the things that I, that I think is really interesting that you kind of touched on is like, as you went through this journey of kind of figuring out your purpose, you allowed yourself to be patient. Number one, you allowed yourself to continue to meditate on it, right? right. It wasn't like, I'm going to jump out of a plane and just go for this thing that maybe feels right. Like you really gave yourself time to sit on this, to let your mind mold this out. And then thirdly, you let, you let the universe or spiritual or whatever you want to call it again, bring it to you because it's like, I'm such a believer right. as well that when you present something into the universe, you're always going to get an answer. Oh, uh, 100%. We create, we create everything we see in front of us. I mean, there's co-creation, but the experience right. that we have is, is ours. We, we, get, we get to take authorship of that. And in fact, coming back to the idea of confidence, if you're authoring something that isn't right for you, you're never going to have confidence. Mm. And so if you're authoring a negative future, yeah. if you're offering a future that is someone else's idea of what you're supposed to do, like I was as a CPA, you're never going to be happy and you're never going to be confident because it's not right for you. So you got to trust that inner feeling. A yeah. lack of confidence is just a lack of alignment, in my opinion. Like you're not heading in the right direction. And you're not <laughs> doing and saying and thinking the right things. That right. is beyond beautifully deep and beautifully articulated. I, I, a, a lack of confidence is a lack of alignment. I love that. Um, yeah. one, one thing I would love if you could expand upon it is I've heard you say in doing some of my research that if we want to know how to get to where we want to go, we got to know where we are today. And one of the things that you said, the three questions you ask is number two, what is my principles? Right? right, because principles can almost act as, as you said, like guardrails as you right. go through the path of your life. And so, I'm curious, how do you figure out what your principles are? Like, how does someone go through that process? I think at all, all three of those questions, but this one is probably a, a good place to start because you, everyone has principles. It's how you're living. Mm. It's like Tony says: you either repel and you want to move away thing, from things, or you're attracted to them and you want to move toward things. <clears throat> we could. We could call those values, right? So most people stop at values and values became, become a list of things that they, that they basically like or don't like. I think a principle is something else. A principle is, it can be related to a value, but it goes much deeper. And it's essentially a, it's a belief tied to some behaviors, which you might also call habits, but it's more than that. Behaviors and habits and habituated action and disciplines that that dictate how you live, right? Yeah. And so it, it represents what you stand for and it represents what you stand against. And that's where the guardrail idea comes in because if it's outside your guardrail, right. then guess what? You stand against that. And if you, if you go over there, right? Like if you, one of your principles is to be um, as fit and healthy as possible, at, you know, for your body type, for your, place in life and, and, and uh, age and everything, then, then you will, you will just take for granted that a daily discipline fitness regimen coupled with healthy eating and hydration and sleep and recovery is just the way you do things. It is part and parcel <laughs> yeah. of who you are, right? It, you don't have to go on these fed diets. You don't have to be all over the place. And it's just who you are because it's yeah. one of your bedrock principles. And anytime you step out of the guardrail, because you, let's say you, you go to a bachelor party and you know, you, you get shit faced all weekend. <laughs> yeah. So what the bottom line is on Monday morning, you're like, Holy shit. You know, I was way over in the pasture last weekend. I knew it. I deliberately did it. Yeah. Get back in the guardrail and get back yeah. on track. Right. I but you don't that. allow that to take you off on a three month binge. And then you're all depressed and sad and, you know, beating yourself up because you're supposed to be this healthy, fit person. Right. Right. And so yeah. like, that's example of a principle. That's one of my principles. I, one of my warrior disciplines is I train every day, rain or shine, 
right? Hmm. If I drank too much wine the night before or not, who cares, right? Yeah, sure I right. do that, right? And so at 57 years old, you know, I'm pretty much as strong as I was or stronger than I was yeah. when I was a Navy SEAL. Yeah. I and train it's smarter, you know, et cetera. It's interesting too, as you look, like as you're explaining these sort of guardrails for your principles, even as you look at your story, as you're being a CPA, it's like, as you're meditating on this, you're starting to have this realization of like, holy crap, this CPA thing that I'm doing is like definitely outside of my guardrails. Let outside. me, let me right. meditate and, and, and figure this out. And ultimately it led you to a path um, where you've, you've done tremendous things, lived an incredible quality of life. And so um, I guess I'm curious for you, Mark. I mean, if people want to get more value, see everything you're up to, I know you have a massive amount um, God, we're just getting warmed up, Stu. We can't stop now. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We're going to have to do a part two. Absolutely. <laughs> no. um, yeah. People want to get more info on you. Where can they find you? Gosh, you know, it's so easy for people these days because all they need to do is Google a name. You know what I mean? So Very true. My website is markdivine.com. Um, people love to start, like, if you love reading and, and my books are in audiobooks, then the two books that a lot of people really love starting with are Unbeatable Mind, which is the name of my company, too. Yeah. And um, that's my self-published book. And I'm actually updating fourth edition right now. I'm, I'm excited to launch that because I first wrote that in 2011. You know, my, I had a little time last year, you know, during the pandemic. So <laughs> I call it the real. pandemic edition. Yeah, right. Love so that. that's coming again, but um, the, the third edition is great and it's up there now. And then the way of the seal. And I think that's the one that you had referenced yeah, or read. And, right. and there, there are different takes on my philosophy. The way of seal is really more about like Navy seal kickassery using these fundamental principles, whereas unbeatable mind is like the philosophy of life. That's like the, the leadership and, and uh, personal development program. And then um, we have this incredible program. This is the one I, I referenced at the wealth mastery when I spoke at Tony's event. Yeah. It's a 30-day introduction to basically how to think and act with an unbeatable mind. So we go into box breathing, the visualization, the micro goals, you know, these big four skills. We talk about the positive um, mental development. It's like 15 minutes a day, and it's ridiculously cheap. Like we wanted this to be near free so as many people as possible could experience the transformation. Right. And then if they want to do something further, they can do it. And, and that's at unbeatablemind.com slash challenge. It was designed as a challenge for 2021. It's going to, you know, it'll be reworked. It's in the process of right. being reworked to be like an evergreen type challenge. It's such a cool program. Yeah. I've got like, you know, 25 or 30 videos that I, you know, developed and we lead you through these journaling exercises. So you'll be journaling, you'll be breathing, you'll be visualizing, you'll be developing micro goals. You'll be able to architect an entire, you know, mission plan from this, depending upon where you want to go. Or if you're in transition, like a lot of maybe your listeners are, listeners are, right. they're thinking like, what's next for me? You know, I, I don't like the path I'm heading. I want to go down a new path or I'm finishing up college or a master's degree. And I want to go this, or I want to, I've been in a corporate job and I want to start my own business or become a coach. Right. You got to architect that all. You got to architect it in your mind. You got to, you got to decide what type of person you need to be to pull that off at the highest level. And then you need to figure out what actions you need to take. So you got to differentiate between the being and the doing. It's a big part of what I think um, is really important that people lack today is, is working on their being. It's mm -hmm. like everything we've been talking about, Stu, you know, everything that led me on my path was uncovering the beingness of Mark Divine, who I was meant to be, why I'm on this planet and what I'm, and then there's the, what am I going to do about it? And that becomes the habits, the disciplines, the mission, and then the targets or the goals. Right. But all of that is preceded by the, the beingness, which is the vision and the intuitive sense of what direction you need to head in your life and your soul's yearnings to grow yeah. and to align with what you're meant to do, how you're meant to serve. You got to spend time in quietude daily and you got to take retreats and go into nature or, or just get away from all the clutter and just put an all stop on the world and just go within. And cultivate that beingness, that sense of confidence that you're heading in the right path. Too many people just stop and they, they're, we're so biased toward action in the Western world. So they just keep doing, 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 trying new things. And they, you know, they're like pinballs, you know, going left, right, yeah. up, down. So just to, you know, slow down before you speed up. I don't know. I, I guess I wanted to get that little last thing in there. Like, this is critical for us. 
you know, the reason our world is so screwed up right now is because everyone's running a thousand miles an hour with a very negative and combative attitude and a victim mindset and um, separated from their spirit, separated from their, you know, the, the source energy that would be driving them toward connection, driving them toward healing, driving them toward love, driving them toward, you know, a, a positive and abundant future. So we need to all just slow down and tap into that goodness. It's not like we have to find the goodness outside of us. It's in us. Like I said yeah. in the beginning, of this we just block it from ourselves. Yeah, it's interesting. I once heard a quote, uh, and I'm going to butcher it a little bit, but it's like we we almost spend our entire life like unlearning who we are and then relearning who we are truly at our essence. Because like you go through all these experiences in your life, and it teaches you really kind of externally to look for everything and you got to kind of strip all that away the rest of your life and really learn right. internally who you are at the core and so um right. you've you've kind of segued perfectly into the last question i want to ask you and i ask this to all of our guests because we do want to help people find direction but we we want to do it through action in some sort of a sense right and again this doesn't need to be pinballing here or there and trying all these different things it can be any action but i would be curious for you and you've sort of alluded at it but Maybe it'd be something different. Um, I would be curious, what would you say is one thing someone listening to this can do in the next 20 to 40, 24 to 48 hours to start finding direction in their life? Well, it would be to, to start a practice I call box breathing. Mm. What I mentioned earlier, people have a difficult time slowing down and, and taking time alone because their minds are so amped up and they're bouncing around and having those, you know, 80,000 thoughts, you know which are the same 80,000 thoughts they had yesterday. Yeah. So box breathing is a practice I developed and I started teaching it to Navy SEAL trainees back in 2006. And I was trying through, through my business seal fit, I was training uh, spec ops candidates and, and the Navy SEALs, I, you know, they wanted to get busy. They wanted to lift weights. They wanted to run. <laughs> yeah. They wanted to swim. They wanted to do all that stuff. Cause again, we're biased toward action and these are badass guys. And so I had them sitting down and I was going to, I was teaching them to meditate, but I couldn't teach them to meditate. So I, and I couldn't even use that term. So I said, listen, we're going to, we're going to use this breathing practice that I found to be critical when I went through SEAL training and I was number one in my class and um, it's called box breathing. And now I got it from yoga, right? It's not anything that hasn't been around for thousands of years. But I, you know, I wanted to call it something that was easy for them to wrap their Western, you know, steel trap brains around. Mm -hmm. And I had to show them very quickly the benefits. And so the reason we start box, so box breathing, by the way, is inhaling through your nose, full lung, mouth closed to a count of four or five, and then holding your breath for the same count, exhaling for the same count, and then holding your breath for the same count. Some people, when you start, you need to maybe do three, right? Because especially the exhale hold is challenging for people. And what this does, it's, it's, as we know now, I didn't know the, this back then, all the science behind it, but obviously there's right. tons of research now, is that you're triggering your parasympathetic nervous system with that nos deep nostril breathing. It's massaging your vagus nerve. It's triggering the parasympathetic, which is the rest and digest, and it's counteracting all the buildup of stress because we're in a constant state of sympathetic nervous system uh, arousal. So this controls that arousal response, and, and it calms you down, it calms you down in, if you do it before a, a challenging event, like a speech, a workout, a podcast, a right. presentation. But if you do it every day as a daily practice for a minimum of five minutes, but I recommend 20 minutes every morning, then it, it begins to s calm your entire body-mind system down. Hmm. And when I say body-mind system is experienced both subjectively and objectively. The objective experience is all the stress starts to bleed off and you get really calm. And when, of course, you're calm, you make better decisions. But also, subjectively, it leads to a, um, a, resonant, you know, a, a more resonant frequency, brainwave frequency that you know, we now know is going to be uh, high alpha, low beta, where you're deeply concentrated and clear. You're clear. And the number of thoughts at alpha, beta is much reduced compared to like high beta, gamma, which is normal, you know, hmm. everyday thinking. And so... With, before we even start, quote unquote, meditating, we use this practice, which is also a meditative practice because meditation right. really is a catch all of a lot of different practices. But we use this practice to bleed off stress and to prepare our body and our brain and our subconscious mind 
and our conscious mind so that we can then go into a practice like I did with Zen, where now I'm going to be sitting and, and uh, trying to control the thoughts by just focusing on one thing, which would be the second step. So box breathing is just start doing that. Just breathe right. for the stress. And then within several months, you'll feel like, wow, this is like extraordinary. Something radically different is happening in my life. I feel so much better. My body's coming back into balance and my mind is calmer. And then we start to use box breathing as a concentration tool where we just visualize that box being drawn. Or we say a mantra, you know, a positive mantra with each leg of the box. Or like mine would be inhale, hold. I'm feeling good. I'm looking good. I ought to be in Hollywood. Exhale, hold. <laughs> Feeling good, looking good, ought to be in Hollywood. Inhale, hold, day by day in every way, stronger and better. hoo yah hey. Exhale, hold, day by day. You get the point. So it becomes yeah. a concentration, but that's got a twofer effect it. because you're, you're greasing the groove of a positive internal dialogue in your mind. And then this is really important, so I, I appreciate you letting me finish this. So you just, do, just do that for – that might be a year's practice because unless you have – unless you have some other thing in your life that's given you that concentration power. Like I had, you know, endurance sports and right. a lot of entrepreneurs are able to concentrate. So concentration, some people are good at it and some people suck at it. So if you suck at it, you need to practice it because it's important for the next phase. If you're really good at it, maybe you do that part just for three months uh, or, or six months exclusively. Then you get to the third part, which is really similar to mindfulness practice where I call it mindful awareness, where now you, you turn that, with that concentration training, you get really good at noticing when you start to wander, right? And snapping back to the concentration. So you can hold your concentration longer and you notice quicker when your mind wanders and you get better and better at snapping it back. So that becomes a really important skill for task and attention control, right? So that like for business or, it, you know, it, you don't get distracted as much and you come right back to the task and you stay on it, right? That's great yeah. for deep work. But now we take our gas pedal off the concentration object, which is the box, and we allow the mind to open up to thoughts again or to allow thoughts again, but we create that metacognitive shift where now we're, we're, we're watching our thoughts. So, now the, so because you develop your strength of your mind, you're able to now shift your internal seat of awareness to where you're, you're in a position of watching. You're like looking at them. Yeah. You're looking at your thoughts. You're thinking about the quality yeah. of your thoughts. Not like yeah. journaling, like what did I think yesterday? That's a little bit different. That's more contemplation. This is being just aware of what's coming up, but not being merged with those thoughts. Right. Or emotions. Like almost right? seeing them float in front of you. Right. So yeah, the metaphors are, yeah, that you're the, you're the mountain and the thoughts are like the clouds passing by in the sky and you just see them. Sometimes they're stormy and you're like, wow, look at that. Look at that drama going on over there. And sometimes <laughs> it's like barely a cloud in the sky and you feel very peaceful and calm. Yeah. That's a critical skill, right? Cause then now we're getting non-reactionary. We, sh we split and we recognize we are not our thoughts totally. and our emotions. We're something much deeper. And then you get to investigate, huh? What is this part of me that is able to just be present and watch my thoughts? And we call that witnessing where now you, the fourth stage is you, you begin to look at that, that experience in and of itself, that part of you that is always there. The part of you, like if I said, Stu, how do you know you're alive? There's part of you that just knows you're alive. Well, that's mm -hmm. your spirit. That's your life force. And that's intelligence. That's wisdom. That's connected to the non-physical realm. It's always there. It's not your thoughts, right? It's beyond space and time. And so you begin yeah. to turn your attention toward that. It's like awareness seeking itself through itself. We call that witnessing. Now, that's profound. And, and so a lot of my clients, it, they, they struggle with understanding that because they want to do it, <laughs> right? Yeah. I want to do that. And I'm like, you can't do witnessing. You are witnessing. Right. And you just have to allow it to make itself known. And once you do, then you begin to live from that perspective. So before that, it's still very powerful because you're living from this non-attached um, totally. perspective of metacognitive. I'm thinking I can see that I'm not going to get drawn in that drama. I can breathe in the seals. We call it 
pause, breathe, think, and then act. So I can pause when something happens or someone drops a, you know, what I call a shit grenade on me. I can breathe into it. I can see what patterns are coming up in my body, you know, the wanting to mm. lash out and punch him in the face. But I don't do any of that because I'm not wrapped right. up in my thoughts. I'm non reactionary I'm not attached. That's all great. But the next stage where I'm living from witness is in that moment, witness says, oh, forgive that person for he knows not what he does, right? I, you know, come from a total place of love. I recognize my sameness in that individual that his witness is no different than my witness. Yeah. But he's caught up in reactionary negativity. And so I need to forgive him or her. And, um, and that's the only way that I'm not going to get drawn up into, into some negative because I'm creating this world. And so if I don't forgive, then I'm creating judgment yeah. and I'm creating negativity. And so the witness says, forgive, and let go and allow this moment to teach. And that's a sea change also in your life. Yeah, I love it. I love cool. it. Well, that is, um, I, I love it. It's, it's not just what can you do in the next 24 to 40 hours, but kind of how can you take this process out over the next year, really implement right. this into your life. Um, and, and I love that kind of third part too, where it's like just just being the the witness, noticing your thoughts and starting to get in that place of allowing yourself. Is that a thought I want to carry with myself today? Is that a thought I want to let go? Is that a thought that's serving me or not serving right. me? Um, truly some incredible things that can come from that. So Mark, right. uh, I just, I just want to say thank you so much for being here. I know you are beyond a busy human um, and, and doing so much good in the world. So thank you for being here with us. I know yeah, all pleasure. of our audience appreciates it. And uh, just thank you so much, my man. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's awesome, Stu. It was really, really a pleasure to talk to you.